So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session today. This is our EdTech session about hypothesis annotation starter assignments. So thank you for joining. And we have Christy DeCarolis, Customer Success Manager for Hypothesis with us. So hello, Christy. So she'll go, go ahead and share her screen. Thanks so much, David. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, as David said, uh, I'm going to be talking about annotation starter assignments with Hypothesis today. Um, and I'm going to put the link to the slides in the chat. So any of the live links that I go through in the um, in the session, you'll have access to through the uh, through the slides there. So uh, that is in the chat now. So the agenda for today uh, is I want to talk about first what social annotation is in case um, anyone's not familiar. I know that Dr. Yarish is very familiar with it, but perhaps not everyone is. So I'm going to talk about um, what social annotation is and why it could be helpful to use in your classes. I'll review some ideas for getting started with annotation assignments. Um, and then I will demo how to uh, set up a hypothesis enabled reading in Blackboard Ultra. So I know some people have started to do this already in the chat. If you could please introduce yourself in the chat and just let me know um, what your name is, what you teach, and if you have any experience with hypothesis, that would be super helpful to me just to understand the context when I'm presenting. Um, you know, I don't want to assume too much or too little knowledge of the audience here, and uh, I want to make sure I can include what might be most helpful to you. So again, if we could just take a couple minutes for intros, that would be fabulous. Great, thanks, Susan. Awesome, thanks, Kimberly. Oh, great. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, my name is Christy DeCarolis. As David mentioned, I'm the Customer Success Manager for Hypothesis and UDC. Um, just quick background on me. Um, I use Hypothesis in my own classes. I adjunct for Rutgers, so I'm teaching right now. My students are using Hypothesis right now. Um, and I was an instructional designer for Rutgers for almost a decade. So I have worked with a ton of faculty uh, integrating tools like Hypothesis into their courses. Um, great. So it looks like most people have kind of used Hypothesis a little bit, might be a little bit familiar with it. Thanks for letting me know. So I want to just do a very quick review in case some people have not seen Hypothesis in a while, what it looks like to annotate in Hypothesis. Basically, I'm just opening a reading in Blackboard. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, I have my reading. And on the right-hand side, what Hypothesis is doing is adding this sidebar um, where students can add annotations and have a conversation about the reading. So in this particular example, um, I have loaded my syllabus into as, as this example on the left, and then students are asking questions and making comments on the right-hand side. Um, Susan, I do see your question. I will talk about that um, a little bit later on. So I uh, just want to let you know that I do see it. So as I am going through, you can see um, on the left-hand side, the text that is highlighted um, is included in the student's annotations. So as the instructor, you can see exactly the text that the student is talking about. And then um, if I click the show replies area in the annotations, it creates a threaded discussion. So students are having um, discussions about the text as they read the text. And you can see 
Um, students are not limited to just text in their annotations. They can add YouTube videos, they can add images, um, and they can add links as well. Um, so we'll get into kind of all the details there, but just wanted to review the basics of what this looks like, uh, just to you know make sure everyone is refreshed on that. So here at Hypothesis, we like to say that Hypothesis makes reading active, visible, and social. Um, Hypothesis makes reading active because it's asking the students to um, reflect on the reading as they're completing it. You know, so if I have this reading pulled up and I'm doing it, um, I'm doing the reading and I think like, oh, I don't actually know what this means. I can pause just right there, um, click the annotate button and add a question. So the students have the opportunity to reflect. They have the opportunity to um, be encouraged to uh, participate in this metacognition, to think about what they connect with, what they don't understand, um, and, and reflect that in their annotations. Hypothesis makes reading visible for us as instructors because we can then see those reflections, right? So we can see what questions students have, we can see um, what connections students are making. In my own course, I find it especially valuable to see the students make connections from prior topics that we've discussed. So students will often reference readings from earlier in the course or topics from earlier in the course, and I'm not prompting them to do that. So it helps me see how they're connecting those topics on their own. Um, and you know can help in deciding how to move forward with the course. And then finally, hypothesis makes reading social. The default setting here uh, in this example that I was showing that all the students can see each other's annotations, the instructor's annotations, I can see all theirs. So we're all collaboratively reading together. Uh, and what I hear from my own students is that this is what is the most helpful aspect of hypothesis to them. Um, being able to see their classmates' perspectives and see their classmates um, explain a concept in a different way helps them better understand that concept. So I think the social aspect of hypothesis is especially powerful for students. Um, and at least that's what I've gotten kind of in, as anecdotal feedback. So why should you use hypothesis in your courses? Um, I kind of talked a little bit about some of these things. It encourages students to participate in metacognition uh, or to practice metacognition as they're reading. So otherwise they might just be kind of skimming through the text and not really having a conversation or a dialogue with themselves about what they're reading. Um, this second point I just really like to highlight uh, it pro prolongs reading engagement through the semester. So I'm not sure at what point in the semester y'all are at at UDC. At Rutgers, I think I'm in week nine of the semester. Um, so I think a lot of times students come into the semester and they're like all gung-ho. I want to get the readings done. I want to do all this. Um, and then by the time we hit like now, <laughs> Week nine, they're getting slammed with midterms, they're getting slammed with projects, and some of the students start to let their readings go. Using hypothesis, make sure that the students continue to engage with the readings throughout the semester. I know my students are doing the readings this week because they're annotating them, and I can see their reflections on those readings. Uh, and it also helps me identify student confusions and where um, some concepts need to be further clarified. Uh, Jasmine mentioned in the chat, I think the social aspect is powerful, but I would like to hear more about how you can use hypothesis for close reading exercises or using the group function for individual readings. Um, we can definitely talk about hypothesis in groups as well, um, because that is one of the features that is um, available in Blackboard. And I think one of the sample assignments that I have here might be useful for that particular use case, Jasmine. Um, so yes, we'll come up with that shortly. Um, I also like to encourage social annotation because it provides a new space for student voices. 
So not all students, if you're teaching a face-to-face -face class, are um, super in, uh, enthusiastic about raising their hand for whatever reason. Um, you know, for me personally, I take kind of a long time to process and think of the answers or something. So I'm not always the person to raise their hand in class, but social annotation allows me to really take the time to think about what I want to say. And I would be more likely to participate more in a social annotation assignment. So you might get a more diverse, you know, diverse student um, contribution experience. Uh, you can also use those annotations to anchor your in-class discussions. So I've heard from a lot of faculty that using social annotation has made their in-class discussions more active because all of the students have already participated in the annotations and they can use those annotations to then drive the class discussion and ask students to collaborate. So what are some different ways that we can prompt students to annotate? Because um, in my experience and from what I've heard from other professors, if you just kind of throw hypothesis onto your assignment, um, then students might try to annotate, but a lot of them haven't really learned how to engage with the text in a meaningful way or in a close way, like Jasmine was mentioning. So sometimes they need a specific prompting um, as part of their annotation assignment instructions. In thinking about how we prompt students, I would first encourage you to think about what your personal purpose for social annotation is. So why would you want to use social annotation in your class? Um, and there are a couple of different considerations to keep in mind. First of all, how many assignments do you think you would use social annotation in? Um, what types and lengths of readings uh, would you use them with? And what is your class size and um, what type of class you're teaching? So I'm going to go into this a little bit more with my class as an example. I teach a 25 student class. It's an asynchronous online class, and they are reading multiple articles every week. Um, that are usually not super long articles. So every week, I've decided that my students will, they use the hypothesis annotations every week in class. And because I have an asynchronous online class, my purpose is that the students are using this as a way to build community, to get to know their classmates, and to contribute to the kind of core uh, knowledge of the class, right? So I teach a course called Gender and Technology. Um, most of the students who take my course are not gender studies majors. They come from lots of other majors. So they have knowledge that they can bring to their readings and add to their annotations. So all of this has influenced how I prompt the students to annotate because my goal is for students to share the content that they know from other classes and from um, their own life experiences and um, to kind of build on that course knowledge and create a community of learners that way. Someone else might have a completely different goal. So uh, another example is from a polymer chemistry professor that I work with. Um, she teaches um, a class where students are mostly reading different um, chapters from an open educational uh, textbook. And it's a very technical class, right? Polymer chemistry, I think they're learning about like plastics and stuff. Honestly, I don't even know. But um, it's a very technical class with a lot of dense text to get through. So instead of having her students read every week, um, this professor has her students reading um, maybe every other week, she goes in and she actually pre-annotates the text with questions for students to answer or things for students to look out for. So she is using the annotations as a way to help guide the students through this technical um, through this technical content that they might otherwise have difficulty with. So because of our completely different subjects and different goals, we're approaching it differently. She also teaches a face-to-face -face class and uses those annotations to prompt her face-to-face -face class discussions. So those are just kind of two examples of different circumstances that might influence how you might prompt students differently to annotate. 
So um, in the following slides, I'm going to have some specific examples of assignments you can use in your classes. Um, and I want to highlight that in the slides, um, this little pencil icon. Oh, I thought I was drawing a box and not a line. Whoops. This little pencil icon that shows up in the upper right hand corner of the slide, um, it actually links to instructions. So if you click the pencil icon, it'll bring you to some instructions that you can use in your class or you can adapt for your class. So the first example here I have is to have students annotate the syllabus. Again, um, this little pencil icon is a link. So if I click it, I have some instructions you can give students to annotate the syllabus. I think this is a great assignment to start. Um, obviously not at this point in the semester because we're already into the semester, but maybe keep this in your back pocket for a future semester. Um, it is a good way to get started with students because it helps them practice using hypothesis as a social annotation tool. Um, it helps set expectations that students are going to be active participants in the class, right? So normally um, giving the syllabus out is a day where students are kind of passive. They're just listening and receiving information, but asking them to annotate is saying like, no, you're going to be active participants in this class from day one. Um, and of course, they read the syllabus, which we all want them to do, and they can ask questions in the syllabus as well. Another way that you can have students annotate is, like I mentioned with the polymer chemistry professor, is to guide your students through the text. Um, so you might want to model the types of annotations that you want them to um, create. Uh, if you think that the students need help in draft, drafting those um, meaningful annotations and uh, you can ask questions for your students to answer and provide definitions or helpful outside resources like embedding a YouTube video or um, embedding images. So in one example, I talked to a professor um, who teaches theater arts. Um, I think he teaches like a set design class, a stage design class. And he told me that when the students are doing the readings, um, he goes in and he adds annotations with images from the different examples of set designs for from particular plays. So the students don't have to leave the reading and they can see these different examples and then talk about, you know, what maybe the strengths and weaknesses are of those examples based on what they're reading in the text and what they're seeing in the annotation. This uh, This example here is a um, kind of the best description of what I do in my own classes. So I open the reading, basically leave it as a blank slate for students because I want my students to be co-creating the knowledge of my class. Um, I don't give them specific instructions for every assignment. They have these general instructions that they are kind of, they have for every single assignment. Their annotation instructions are the same. Some people use different instructions for every annotation assignment. So that is really um, something that works for my own purposes and goals in annotation. In some, um, in some disciplines like science, for instance, it might be a good uh, practice to ask students to practice key skills related to problem solving. You could have students explain how they might solve a problem before they actually do it. You could have them highlight different technical passages in the, um, in the text and ask them to explain it as if they were explaining it to a layperson. So something like that can be really great at getting to the root of how well the students understand a topic. You can also use it so students can clarify the notation and syntax in a scientific text. And then Jasmine, this is the slide I was thinking of when you brought up close reading and using um, small group functions for individual readings. Um, I think this could be a good opportunity to give students different group roles to encourage different types of annotations and practice annotating from multiple perspectives. 
So if I click on the instructions for this particular meeting, um, I'm going to zoom in on this a bit so we can see. Um, you could create groups where each of these students are assigned a specific role. One student is a discussion leader who is supposed to add questions to the reading for the course to, for the rest of the group to discuss. One could be a passage master to um, summarize key passages. One could connect by adding um, multimedia or connecting to previous course materials and things like that. And then another could be the devil's advocate. And there's lots of other different group roles that if you search online, you could find. But this is a great way to have students practice um, reading the course with different, uh, reading the course, reading the text with different goals in mind, looking for what are the main ideas, um, looking for key questions, um, thinking about it in a sense of like, how is this text related to the outside world? What outside resources could I bring in? So I think these um, splitting the tech, uh, splitting the the class up into these smaller groups could offer some possibilities uh, like this. Uh, and then the last strategy I want to offer um, that gets overlooked a lot, I think, is to have students annotate um, course documents like instructions or study guides. So a lot of times people come to me and they're like, Christy, I am having my students read like a physical textbook. So I don't know how I'm going to use hypothesis. But if you have um, any other course documents, students can annotate those. So they could annotate lecture slides. If you save your PowerPoint lecture slides as a PDF, they could annotate that. They could annotate study guides or project instructions. Um, there's one biology professor I worked with who has her students annotate learning objectives before an exam as a way to prepare for the exam. So there's lots of different uh, strategies you can use with just the course materials. My students, I think in two weeks, are going to be annotating the unit two project instructions because I'm hoping to see how the students are interpreting those instructions because they're like a little bit, the project's a little bit abstract, I will admit. So I want to make sure they're interpreting it correctly and address questions before they actually start working on it. Um, so I have been talking for a bit now, so I want to pause. Before I start talking about hypothesis in Blackboard Ultra specifically, does anyone um, have any questions or thoughts about what uh, how they might use annotation? Or Jasmine, I don't know if you want to share how you have used it in your own course. I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I can't share my video right now. I'm kind of like running around doing multiple things. but. Um, and I'm like bundled up because I feel cold for whatever reason on this, you know, second day of spring. Um, one of the things that I started to try to do this semester with one of my classes is do, because um, a lot of our classes aren't very large. So sometimes the group annotate group version of hypothesis seems a little strange. Um, but I have tried this semester to do it as an individual assignment, which you can do by creating groups and just putting one student in each group to get them to identify things in a text that are related to say like a guest lecture. So I had a guest lecture talk about um, certain strategies for archiving, which I'm teaching a class on archiving. And then they read a short um, piece about archivists and what they do. And I asked the students to find an example in that article of each one of those techniques from the guest lecture. It's actually been really, really helpful. It's a good way to, um, so for those of us who are quiz creators, but some of our students are like, we don't like quizzes right? You know, trying to figure out how to create a, a multiple choice version of this. I think hypothesis can be used as a quiz as well for this kind of work, right? Getting them to identify certain versions of, um, of a specific technique applied to a different text. So that's been really helpful this semester. And that's the one of the first, the new things that I've been doing with hypothesis that I found really helpful. Thanks so much for sharing. And I'm realizing now that I, re I totally misread your comment about using the group function for 
students to actually annotate individually. So sorry about that, um, because then the group rules is not helpful for you. <laughs> um, Still very helpful. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Susan asked in the chat, do you have any tips to encourage students to make meaningful annotations? So I, I would check out the instructions that I have linked in the slides because they guide the students um, as to ways to annotate in a meaningful way. Like they kind of provide guidance for, you know, what might be a helpful annotation, what might be a helpful way to respond to a classmate. Sometimes in the first couple of weeks of the semester, I find myself still having to like nudge the students a little bit and be like, okay, I see that you said you agree with the author about this but can you give an example of why you agree? So like, I'll have to nudge a little bit, um, but after a couple of weeks of giving them some nudging and you know providing the guidance, uh, they tend to pick up and understand what it means to um, annotate in a way that's adding to the conversation and not just kind of like shallowly like being you know, like, yeah, yeah, great point or something. Any other thoughts or questions? Right. So I want to go over some of the details of what you can do in Hypothesis and Blackboard Ultra. Um, and then I'll also share about like adding multimedia to the annotations as well. So I think all of you know at this point, um, based on your experience with Hypothesis, that uh, Hypothesis um, is deeply integrated into Blackboard Ultra. So students don't have to uh, sign in to anything separate. They don't have to create an account. They just open their reading and they're annotating. And then you can also grade the annotations if you choose to do that. So right in Blackboard Ultra, I'll get sent back to the grade center. Um, and in this particular, oh, no, I have too many tabs open. That's not great. Um, in this particular assignment, uh, you can see at the top here, there's a grading bar um, at the top of the annotation assignment. And um, here are the students that have added annotations. And I can filter by a particular student and it'll show me just their annotation. So it makes it pretty easy to grade annotations if I do want to give students credit for what they have done in the course. Or in Becky's case here, what they have not done in the course. Um, and then as Jasmine was saying, uh, you can use the group sets in Blackboard for either creating smaller groups for annotating or another popular um, use case that Jasmine was talking about is if you use the group sets, you can actually create groups of one student so that annotate each student is annotating their own doc their own document like it's not actually different documents but students are annotating privately instead of as a group so depending again on your goals for annotation and your purpose for annotation creating groups of one might be helpful for you to kind of test the students knowledge as they annotate um, or you can create small groups of like two or three and just have students annotate in small groups that way so some more specifics about annotating. Um, what exactly can you annotate? Uh, Hypothesis works best with open educational resources. So you can annotate web pages and online articles um, that are uh, publicly available. You can annotate PDFs. Uh, and then you can annotate open textbooks and OER, open educational resources, that um, whether they're a PDF or they're a URL. So you can load those all into Blackboard Ultra to be annotated. Right now, we are working on other in integrations to make more, um, more items available to be annotated. Um, we are piloting integrations with JSTOR. That's our first library database we're integrating with. And then Vitalsource e-texts as a paid uh, e-text source is a um, another uh, integration that we're working on. So we're hoping in the future we'll have more library databases and um, <coughs> more paid e-texts. 
Yes, David, if you email me, um, let me know. I can see if we can turn on the JSTOR integration for UDC. Um, and then the, the librarians get super happy about the JSTOR integration because then it, um, you know, keeps their stats for the usage of the articles where, uh, you know, it tracks those things. So they tend to like that integration. <laughs> And then what can you put into an annotation? This is another kind of powerful part of hypothesis that I think sometimes is ignored, um, not intentionally, but it kind of looked over because people uh, tend to really lean on annotating with text, uh, but you and your students can add images to annotations. They can embed videos from YouTube or Vimeo. You can add equations using LaTeX. And then you can also add links and tags. And I think this is powerful because of the ability to um, bring in multiple means of representation to the text. So not every student is going to learn the best by reading about something, right? Some students might learn better by seeing a diagram or by watching a video. Um, and being able to bring these things together might um, help a student better understand a concept. So I have this one example uh, where I'm reading a physics textbook and they explain the law of conservation of momentum. And I don't understand the explanation by reading that. But if I watch a video of it, then it makes complete sense to me. Um, you watch two pool balls smack each other and, you know, how the momentum gets transferred from one to the other. And that makes sense. With hypothesis, we can bring all those things into one space. Um, and students don't have to go to another space to watch a video or to see a diagram or an image of something. We have instructions here on how to add links and images and how to add videos to annotations that you can share with students. But I will um, also just demonstrate how to do that here um, in case anyone uh, would like to know that. But does anyone have any questions about these before I do the demo? Ooh, that's a good question. Dr. Brown, you can add GIFs. So I don't, I think a different faculty have different feelings about this. Um, I think it can be fun and you can add GIFs and have a lot of fun with that. And some people, I don't, I don't know if they want to, if they want to do that, but yes, as long as um, you have the image URL for it, you can add a GIF. So I will demonstrate. Um, okay, so I'm going to go into one of my readings here, and I will show how to add each of these different multimedia items um, if this loads. Got to love when it's taking a long time to load. Um, okay, so UDL is one example here. Maybe I want to add an image of uh, something related to UDL. Um, so something like this perhaps could be, well, not this one because that image is very poor quality, um, but maybe something like this could be helpful for my students. Um, so what I would do in this case is once I get into Google, um, one thing to keep in mind is to add an image to an annotation, it has to exist online already. You can't upload an image to an annotation. Um, so I found an image on Google. I don't want to copy this URL. Sometimes I see people making that mistake. I actually want to right click on this image and then choose the copy image address option. And then when I go back into my reading, um, and I think this actually was a article by um, UDC folks, right? I just happened to pull it up because it's one of my favorite ones to use. Um, but I'm going to highlight this and click annotate. And I would click on this image um, icon here. And you'll see that there is some code that comes up. And some of the text is already highlighted here. 
If it's not highlighted for some reason, I want to make sure that I highlight the text in between the parentheses and replace it by right clicking and pasting my image URL into here. And I want to make sure again, there's no spaces here in between the parentheses and the URL. I can click the preview button to see if my image has loaded in. It looks good to me. So then I can click post and my image is loaded into here. So I have added my image uh, annotation. Um, links are quite similar to images. So maybe I want to link to an art, another article about uh, UDL guidelines. Um, so I'm going to copy the URL of this resource, uh, go back to um, my article, and then in this case, um, I'm going to type what text I actually want linked here. I'll select that text, click the chain link icon, and then again, I have this like Space where I have this URL I have to replace. So I'll right click and click paste preview, and then it'll show and I'll, I'll be able to post it. And with links, you can even just um, paste it and it will become a live link. Um, it just, you know, this example has text and this is showing the URL. For videos, YouTube videos are actually the easiest one to. Um, to add in. So if I go in and find a video that I want to add to an annotation, I would click on the video. I could either copy the URL from the top of the URL bar, or I can click share to copy this URL. Either one is fine. And then I can um, annotate. All I have to do for a YouTube video is paste the URL into the annotation, and it'll automatically embed there. So that is the easiest one for sure um, out of all those examples. And then I'll just see if I can. Find a quick GIF example, which the GIF example is pretty much the same as a image. So it's the same process where I want to copy the image address, click on this little image button, and then paste the, the GIF um, and URL. And I have my, my GIF in there so I can have some, some fun times. Um, all right. So, and again, those instructions are at the bottom of the slide there. Um, any questions about any of those pieces since I didn't go over quite everything on the slide? Equations, that's a good one. So equations, you have to use LaTeX um, for the equations to be inserted into annotations. So what I tend to do is recommend finding um, an online LaTeX editor. Ooh, sorry, I didn't, I typed something in the chat and actually I'm just trying to type into Google. So I have a um, online LaTeX editor here. So I can have, um, I can create my equations using, um, you know, the buttons here. Um, so if I just wanted to say something like, five is greater than, I don't know if I clicked greater than or less than, oops. Um, so, <laughs> but you can type in whatever you need to here. Um, I'm making a nonsensical equation and it will give you the code that I can copy here. And then um, if I paste that code, I click on the little equation and then paste it and it will create my uh, LaTeX equation there. 
So I would just point them to a, you know, like a LaTeX equation editor online, uh, and then they can copy and paste into there. Um, and they would actually be doing real equations and not made up ones like me. Um, all right. So one note about PDFs um, with hypothesis is they do have to have um, optical character recognition on them. Um, that's what that OCR stands for um, here, which means essentially if I open a document on my computer, I need to be able to select the text, copy and paste that text from the PDF. If I can't do that, then um, that means that the students will not be able to highlight text in Hypothesis. The most common case for that is when um, people have scanned documents on like their home scanner, uh, then those tend to not have uh, selectable text. If that's the case, then we have a website that's linked here uh, where you can load in your PDF and it will give you a version back with OCR. So I'm not sure if UDC has other resources sometimes um, resources, uh, sometimes institutions have access to like Adobe Acrobat or Census Access or other tools that do this as well. But this is a super easy resource to use where you can just put in your PDF uh, that doesn't have OCR and it will give you a version back that does have OCR. Um, okay, so I do have instructions here. I'm, I'll go through how to set up um, a hypothesis reading in Blackboard Ultra, just so everyone is kind of aware of the process. But I do have instructions on this uh, slide as well. So everything that you need to know is linked on this slide in case you need to come back to it later on. Oh, thanks, David mentioned in the chat that you do have Adobe Acrobat access at UDC. So you can also use that to um, add the OCR to a text. Oh, now I'm just checking off random places. All right, so if I go to my Blackboard Ultra course, um, I will want to click on the plus sign that shows up in my course content area. And then I'll go to content market to start the process for adding my hypothesis enabled reading. Once I'm in content market, and I'm sure yours will look a little bit different because of what you have available at UDC, um, you should just see hypothesis like one version of it. We have lots of versions for testing. Once you find hypothesis in the content market, you actually want to click the little plus sign in the right hand corner of the box. Don't don't click the box itself. I did that. I always want to do that. Um, but you want to click the little plus sign. And basically what that does is it creates kind of the shell for your assignment. So that's what has shown up here. Um, and what I want to do with this is set up my settings first. So now I have my assignment shell. I'm going to click on the three dots on the right hand side, click edit to, to set up kind of the settings for this assignment, what I want the students to see as far as instructions and things like that. So up top here, I'm going to edit my title. Maybe I want this to be my week five reading. Um, I can click that I want to create a grade book entry for this item. If I want to, you know, make it graded, if I want to have a due date, I can create that. And then if for the description, I can input um, some of my uh, assignment instructions. So I'll just grab some from here and then paste that in my description here. Oh, it's too long. So maybe I'll have to work on making that shorter. And then I'll save. And then once I have set up those basic 
um, settings, I'll actually click on the title itself to attach the reading. So once I've opened this up, um, you won't see again, JSTOR and Vital Source are not available everywhere yet. So you'll see these other options. Um, enter the URL of a web page or a PDF, select a PDF from Blackboard, or select a PDF from Google Drive or OneDrive. If you're using a PDF, that's not this first option, the URL. I would recommend using the Google Drive or OneDrive option just because it tends to be a little bit easier for people. Um, selecting a PDF from Blackboard can involve some extra steps with permissions. And sometimes if you copy the course over semester to semester, the assignment can get a little bit cranky, not work right. Um, so I would really recommend if you're using a PDF um, to do the Google Drive or the OneDrive option. So I'm going to select a PDF from Google Drive. Since that's what I have, the OneDrive process is pretty similar. I have the option here to choose an article that I already have loaded into my Google Drive, or if I have it on my hard drive, I can upload it at this point to my Google Drive. So that's a nice option as well. So I'm going to load in um, something that I already have in my Google Drive. At this point, if I wanted to make a, a small group assignment, then I could select this option. So that would be if I want students not to annotate as a whole class, if I want students to just annotate in groups of like three or five or something like that, I would check that off. But I just want students to annotate all together for the syllabus annotation. So I will click continue. And then my annotation assignment is ready to go. I have my reading on the left here and then my annotation sidebar on the right. Um, so those were the kind of basics for setting up the, the reading in Blackboard Ultra, this first, uh, this first link here. Uh, do we have any questions about that process or thoughts? Okay, so um, thanks, Susan. I always like, I just like to pause an awkwardly long amount of time because sometimes people take a bit of time to type the questions. So um, I do have instructions here. If you want to learn how to set up the small groups with hypothesis, or um, if you do want to use Blackboard course files, feel free to check those out. And then finally, to wrap things up today, I just want to remind everyone of some of the resources that you all have access to as part of um, being a partner with Hypothesis. Uh, so you can always meet with me. My link to my calendar is on this slide, the one-to-one -one instructional design consultation. I'm always happy to meet with you to walk you through setting up a Hypothesis-enabled reading if you want um, to make sure you're doing it correctly. I'm also happy to brainstorm different ways that you can use Hypothesis in your class. So um, there's plenty of people sign up uh, for time on my calendar and they're like, you know, Christy, I have this idea, but I don't know how to really make it work. It's always good to just have someone to bounce ideas off of. Some other helpful resources um, include um, Liquid Margins is our uh, panel interview show where we interview faculty from across the country about different ways they use hypothesis. Our next one, I believe, is going to be, I'm going to get the date on this wrong, March 30th, I think, March 30th. And Jasmine is going to be on Liquid Margins on March 30th. So I think that's a great reason for all UDC people to go, because I'm sure she'll be fabulous. Um, so we have lots of past recordings of Liquid Margins, too um linked here so you can see if other science professors have used it or if other um you know of history professors have used it and, and how they have done that um the resources 
link here also features instructions from other faculty members. So if I click on that, I can see um, things that others have, I zoomed out here, um, things that others have used. Um, so the learning objectives annotation assignment is an example of an assignment that another faculty member um, from one of the CUNY schools submitted. So you can see lots of examples of assignments on the resources page. We have partner workshops every week. So if you're ever interested in learning more about hypothesis, every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we have a workshop about a different topic. And, um, oh, I didn't have my Hypothesis Academy slide in here. Um, usually I'll throw this in here afterwards so you have access to it. But we also have a new, um, a new program running called Hypothesis Academy. Uh, it's a two week asynchronous course um, that runs, like takes you through the basics of using Hypothesis, but also kind of presents different pedagogical ideas for using it and, and helps you develop your annotation assignment. So it's a lot more um, focused on pedagogy instead of just the technical details of Hypothesis. And um, there's faculty participating from all over the country. So it's great to get ideas and talk to other faculty there. Um, our second cohort is running now and our third cohort is gonna be starting in May. So if you're interested in that, I'm gonna drop this link into the chat. Um, it's no cost, it's included in the subscription. Um, and I will I'll add that to the slide. Usually I have a slide in there about Hypothesis Academy as well. Um, all right, so that is all I had for today. Um, my email is here. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, or if you want to set up some time to chat, I would be happy to help you get started with Hypothesis um, or answer any questions we have in our last few minutes. Yeah, and thank you so much, Christy. Um, I do want to open up the floor to any questions from our participants today. But if not, Christy, uh, I could ask you a question. Um, what are the three key points that you hope participants gained from this webinar? Three key points that I hope participants gained from this webinar. Um, how to set up a hypothesis enabled reading and Blackboard Ultra. Um, an idea for how they can use hypothesis in their class um, and why they should use hypothesis in their class. Excellent. And I think you did a home run today, right? So you answered all those questions. Uh, thank you so much. So I do want to just add a couple more links in the chat box. So the first one is our uh, the slide deck uh, that Christy shared earlier. So if you'd like to see that, that's that first link in the chat box there. A uh, second one, I did find that liquid margin. So that's next uh, on March 30th with Dr. Yarish. That's next Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, if you'd like to sign up to see that. And we also have our Cal Hypothesis resources. That includes Christy's link to meet with her. So if you click on that, that'll go over some getting started information about using Hypothesis, also meeting with Christy. And last but not least, if you do have any questions for the Cal team, our uh, email is calhelpdesk at udc.edu. Right? So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Yarsh, for coming as well. Christy, I do wanna thank you again for your time. Uh, this was a very informative webinar and I appreciate it. I learned a lot myself, so we look forward to our next webinar. And for everyone else, thank you again for joining us today. We do value your time and we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks bye -bye. so much for coming, everyone. Thank you. Take care.